Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I think we'd like to start. And I would like to start with a small introduction about the format of the research cluster. This is an event of um, the research cluster for concrete geometries. And for those of you who don't know much about this particular format, the research clusters have been launched in 2005 here at the AA in order to promote different forms of research in um, 18 months um, sort of phases. And concrete geometries, I think, was the, uh, within the third phase of clusters. Concrete geometries focuses on collecting, discussing, and evaluating work that critically explores the immediate relationship between spatial form and social and aesthetic processes, so human processes. So we're focusing on how geometric aspects of space, such as size, shape, or relative position of figure, might influence the behavior of individuals or collectives in a very direct and immediate sense. And why are we doing this here at the AA? The AA has been at the forefront of producing sort of novel geometries for the past decade. It's really been leading that process. However, we feel that the cultural evaluation of these is really lacking behind. And this is not meant as a critique, but as a sort of extension of that particular research. So we're proposing three shifts. And the first shift is to think about geometries not only in technical terms, assuming that's been done over the past 10 years, but in relation to experiential and suicidal um, issues. The second point is to open up that debate to a broader audience outside the confines of architecture schools and perhaps also outside um, the discipline of architecture. The third proposal is um, to open up that frame of evaluating these types of geometries away from the phase of production and to include this messy phase of post-occupancy that uh, includes the consumption and reception of these spaces through viewers, users, and audiences. When we started our research, we started with a number of questions which are very basic and simple, saying how does spatial form socially and how is it socially and experientially relevant? How does it actually choreograph human processes? Can it stimulate emotional or behavioral responses? Can it pattern cultures? We started our work in 2010 by launching an open call for submissions. And uh, we purposefully went down that route of uh, launching an open call rather than uh, going with a curated approach because we really wanted to look at what's out there and to go beyond uh, the type of work and the type of networks we already had. In May 2010, we uh, featured 50 of these works in an exhibition which we called a preview exhibition, very much work in progress. In October, we had a symposium where 22 internationally emerging and renowned artists, architects, and designers started to discuss the idea of spatial form as a socially and experientially relevant tool. We're currently operating a, a website, working with 30 of the participants on the production of an exhibition, which is going to happen in May, and a publication, which will happen after that. We're receiving funding now, which is a great thing for a research cluster, because it's meant to create a sort of launch had for projects to perhaps spiral into an unknown future. And that's sort of happening with this cluster. We are um, shortlisted for a second phase now, um, an extension of this, which will kind of shift the emphasis from uh, phase one, which was really about reviewing and collecting work, to a phase <coughs> of application and on-site tests in life environments. So today, this is very much a phase one event. This is about um, looking at a series of case studies, and for that I would like to introduce and, and welcome very warmly Christian Posthofen and Arno Brandlhuber, who made their way from Berlin to join us here for this particular event. Arno Brandlhuber is founder of um, Brandlhuber Plus, which is an architectural practice that researches and builds. He also holds a chair for architecture and urban research at the Academy of Fine Arts in Nuremberg, which is a nomadic master's program. Um, Christian Posthofen is a philosopher and uh, CEO at Walter König Books. Um, together they founded Academy CEO, which is something that we became aware of and found very interesting. Academy CEO promotes a broader understanding of architectural issues and the core of its thesis is defined as the ordering of social relations through building. 
and this is why um, we thought they have, they have to come here. This seems to be the perfect thesis to discuss, discuss in an environment like this. So thank you very much for coming and I'm very glad you could make it. We would like to hold this uh, as a seminar, so it's a, it's a kind of open event. We're not quite certain of its format, so in a sense it's a learning session which should include the audience as much as it includes us as participants of this event, so um, we would like to invite you to join in. But the start, I think Anu is going to start the presentation. Yes, I would shortly try to give an idea about what we're doing otherwise than researching and how we came together. So I started my architectural practice, like a company's practice, 15 years ago with the Neanderthal Museum. So it's accommodating the Neanderthal man and it looks like in the inside. Ten years ago, the first project, uh, normally work in collaborations to tell you. So the first one was together with Sam Kelp and Julius Kraus. Sam Kelp is coming from House Ruger and Cohn, Austrian company. This one is together with uh, Ben Knies. So like ten years ago, we started to think about developing architecture out of quite abstract modules that are not already defined to a certain use. So they can become living, they can become production of any way. So, so that's what's inside this building. Not to explain it too uh, far. Like five years ago, we realized together with Dr. Mantra, a sports and cultural center in Copenhagen, where we shifted again to a question whether the, the set qualities that are normally required for architecture, like temperature, and other terms are so necessary just to play football, for example. Or maybe it's even worse to keep the temperature a little bit down and therefore have double space. So the, the questions of standard. Another question was, which is already going into geometry, was how we can develop architecture just by the surrounding conditions, also spatial-wise. Yeah, so this is a spatial condition outside, go, going back. And you will see here that's just the length of a, a soccer <coughs> game play, uh, crowd. And recently, that's a building in Berlin, where also our office or the, res the design office is based. I think it's one of the reasons we are here, because it's part of the, this concrete ge geometry program, because we had a contract with the owner from the back courtyard that we should cut the building according to the sun and light entering this normally quite dark courtyard. So in this case, form was not generated by what we normally are into if we design objects, but it's much more about the uh, surrounding conditions. What you can see here in the, in the upper part is how it's cut away from the like following a line from the first level to the top level of the roof on the opposite side of the street. On the other hand, I'm directing a master program with a lot of publications, like small books like this one, who's interested in. And one of these was published by Christian Posthoven. It's called Theory in Praxis. And he is part of our program. It's a research master program. It's not so much about designing architecture, but on researching urban conditions. And he was very, in the first beginning, starting to train us who is Emmanuel Kant. And it was quite difficult for us. I'm quite sure that the text-based part he will introduce today will be quite difficult in the beginning. But maybe we can have like small breaks to ask him what he's talking about. We opened, we, th then we recognized that normally you always keep inside a school system. It's not an open system, so it's just students in or professors. In. So we started a program like a public seminar in Berlin, researching on Raumproduktion der Berliner Republik, which could be translated like spatial production of the Berlin Republic. Berlin Republic means after 
the reu reunification. And it's a public seminar because we thought it might be much more interesting to share this experience with a wider audience than just inside a closed circle. And one of the first ones who had a lecture there was, I would present it soon as one of three case studies, was a Protestant theologist who was much more precise in describing the social effects of architecture than we were in that moment. And to come back to one problem that might occur in the following one hour, like the main uh, uh, phrase Christian was putting up in his, in his text is Vorstellungsorientierung, which could be translated, that was your, uh, like guidance for conceivability, <laughs> which is not so really clear what it could mean. We could also call it like conceptual orientation, which is a little bit more active. Or we could also call it like ordering imagination. Or So we will see that we will bring into terms, we will keep them in term because it's much easier for us, and then try to build a construction around to give you an idea. So maybe we... And what, what we're going to do is to look on architecture not on a, a <coughs> formal way, not on the formal qualities at all, not on the material qualities, but how is it like really changing social effects? And that's coming up as a completely different research in architecture. So it's not only about inclusion or exclusion like social wise, but a lot more than we thought when we than we thought before when we were starting this program, this research. Okay, so maybe you start. Thank you very much for the invitation. I think we are really good in this program because all you talked about uh, when I listen now is we can only say yes, yes, yes. Um, I think the most important point is the attitude which an architect or a group of people who, was, who want to make some practice has before starting with this practice and um, Maybe we can find in the next hour, step-by-step, uh, step how it is, why it is impossible to don't have such an attitude. About the inhold of this attitude, everybody is responsible by himself and maybe in the communication with his social group and uh, it belongs on him how open he is to other fields, to other people, with other opinions, with other attitudes. But at first we say there is this attitude which, uh, makes, uh, which makes a form and this form again goes back to the attitudes of the customers of that form. So we, we have in the beginning of our, uh, of our program uh, Academy, Academy CO in Berlin, this open program about uh, what Arno was talking and this should be observed and researched. As a result, a point can be made that makes it possible to assess uh, precisely the ideological influence in planning and so open up the possibility of alternatives. Of course, in the majority of cases of such planning, the ideological aspect is developed in such a way that the discourse around it can be disregarded. That doesn't mean, however, that it isn't there. My considerations stem from a meta-theory that comes from philosophy and epistemology. So one cannot just say, but my garage is definitely apolitical. That's of course not the question. It has far more to do with the possibility of thought that the um, imagious possibility of a thought as a model with which one can approach reality. It is only on this level that it is possible to determine whether the garage is in fact a, a political. 
The question only arises after the model has been sought up in the meta theory. That is uh, to say, the thought only arises if there is a specific mental trauma coming from the reality. This was uh, the part with the hard facts like walls. Now we come to a second part of influence of uh, ideological uh, concepts in architecture, um, which we found in a study, in a case study in North Korea. Wait, or shall we keep on? Hmm? That will take some minutes to explain. It is, it's a very strange concept. It's a second case study. This is the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang. You will discover a lot of flowers around. Especially this orchid. You might know this hotel ruin in the back. But all over the city you will find flower ornaments. Once again the orchid on the door in museums, but also like the public lightning. <coughs> One begins this orchid. And we were astonished why Pyongyang was looking so full of flowers. Then we recognize that it's basically two flowers. One on the left hand, the orchid, and a begoni, is it called? Begoni? On the right hand. And then we discovered a lot of women, but not only women, dressed in the same color than this orchid. And we went into a performance, so all this orchid-colored dressed women forming orchids again. And in the back part, orchids all over, in this kind of screenplay. We thought there must be some story behind. Why should they show us always orchids together with the whole earth? This is like very small kids, like six to nine years old, performing. And all the background, all the pixels of the background, is formed by students, 30 to 50,000 students. So go ahead. Just going back for a moment, so these little dots you see here is all like the heads. The next strange thing we ended building that were used as like not like greenhouses but like flower shows and still the same orchid around. And then the old president, like Kim Il-sung, like the father of Kim Jong-il, on paintings, still the same orchids. And then in between all these flowers, these two huts. <coughs> that remind more, like we know it from, from like a crash or a nativity scene like for Christmas. And they're also existing, like a reconstruction. That's also in Pyongyang. You will have broadcasted it in television with all these orchids around. If there's like international meetings, there are not so many. 
So this is a meeting between the South Korean pro uh, president and the North Korean president. The same archives on the table. And the whole story starts here. And I will read some phrases of a book that Kim Jong-il, the current <coughs> president of North Korea, wrote in 2006. Juche, 95, because they have their own timetable. And it's called <coughs> Kim il Sungya is an immortal flower that has bloomed in the hearts of mankind in the era, in the era of independence. Will take some minutes. <laughs> I won't read the whole. So there was a visit of Kim Il Sung, the, the old president, the, the father of Kim Jong Il, to Indonesia, which was one of the rare international meetings he ever had beside China. As a great event that set up a new milestone in the development of relations with the newly emergent countries of Asia and Africa, his visit to Indonesia 40 years ago will shine forever in the annals of our country's diplomacy. During his visit to Indonesia, the leaders and people of that country accorded him their warmest welcome as well as extraordinary hospitality. All the events receiving him were held in a great way. The hospitality, President Sukarno, who was the president of Indonesia at the time, the hospitality, hospitality President Sukarno accorded to President Kim Il-sung was an especially warm one, cherishing high respect for President Kim Il-sung. Sukarno treated him with utmost sincerity. When visiting the Bogor Botanical Garden, I felt more deeply how much President Sukarno respected and revered President Kim Il-sung. With a long history, this world-renowned botanical garden was well worth visiting. With flowers of the orchid family, cactuses and other rare tropical flowers in full bloom, I felt as if we were visiting a world flower fair. When we approached a display in a greenhouse of the botanical garden, garden, Sukarno took a pot of flowers from the director of the botanical garden and asked President Kim Il-sung how he liked the flowers. The director explained that it was a variety of the orchid family of famous florists of the garden had bred after long painstaking research and it was a peculiar, no that's not the English peculiar. word, peculiar flower <laughs> and that it blossomed twice a year. That's maybe an important moment, plus and twice a year, being in bloom for two or three months. After looking at the flower for a while, President Kim Il sung that it was very beautiful and expressed thanks to the host for showing such a fine flower. Then Zucano said sincerely that he wanted the flower to be named after President Kim Il sung The director of the botanical garden too expressed his wish to call it Kim Il sung -ya. From olden times, flowers have been considered symbols of beauty, love, peace, and best wishes. Some flowers are named after their shapes or characteristics, and others after persons. But none had previously been named after a great man. Naming a raw flower bred at the Bogor Botanical Garden after President Kim Il-sung, Kim il -sung -ya, was an expression of the high regard prominent figures and people of the world paid to a man who had rendered such brilliant services to mankind. One cannot be moved here in the story about how the flower came to our motherland. Our officials who went to Indonesia to trace the flower found that after the rapid change of situation in that country, the director of the Boga Botanical Garden had worked and... Just to tell you, the, 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 this botanical director was called Bund. He was Dutch at that time.
After its arrival of the Kimmelsonia in our country, it in I ensured that the flower was sent to the Central Botanical Garden for study of the methods of its cultivation and propagation. It was no easy task to adapt the flower to the climatic and soil conditions of our country and propagate it. But convinced that the officials and researchers of the Central Botanical Garden would succeed, I ensured that they were given positive assistance by the party and the military. A special greenhouse was built, an institute with highly qualified researchers was organized and the latest equipment and material necessary for their work were provided. Kimilsunia is a national treasure and it's a great pride and honor for the Korean people to have an immortal flower named after President Kim Il-sung. Maybe the last sentence. I believe that our officials will cultivate Kim Il-sung's <coughs> success, propagate it widely and conduct education properly by means of the flower. I read again. Last sentence. I believe that our officials will cultivate Kim il with success, propagate it widely, and conduct education properly by means of the flower. So just to explain, so on the left hand, this is Kim il the old president, which now is called the eternal president, if you think back to the crash, to the nativity scene. On the right hand, his son, So the eternal president is symbolized by the Kim il sunia And the recent president then came up to represent himself by this begonia. <laughs> so what you see here is not a sign of flowers. It's the eternal president covering the recent president. And everybody in the city reads it exactly like that. So this painting of North Korea, which is called in German translation, mit dem Gefühl der Verehrung, with a uh, feeling of, what's Verehrung? Oh, no. Admiration. Admiration. It's not just a, just flowers in a, uh, in a pot, it's the two presidents. This is the North Korean AA, though it's the entrance to the architectural, uh, it's a mixture between school and production of all uh, huge monuments. And you see the same elements. It's the Kim il -sunia. It's the birth house of the president, though the nativity scene. And when you enter the foyer, the lobby of the Pyongyang AA, you will find the begonia. So the president is all around. This is a book, it's called On Architecture. It's 180 pages how to make architecture do, and how to take the architect as a real weapon for the, uh, yeah, for the state interests. And it's completely declared, uh, explained. So once again, if you have a quite banal scene like this in the, at a subway entrance, you will always find the president around here on the right hand side, or the current one, Kim Jong-il. And if you look at people like gathering together, this kind of two colors, also carrying on their bikes, they are on their way to switch between the eternal president, which is this color, the Kim Il-sunia, and the Kim jong il the, the Begoni. So the whole city is constructed by the means of the flower. So once again, every of this pixel is one of the 30,000 students which is having this kind of changing paper blocks to create this back screen. Yes, and this again here is a formation which, which uh, 
with the flower, symbols, and that's uh, symbolizing the people itself, that they have a certain, a third flower. So this is something else, uh, ordering uh, social situations through architecture, um, which is maybe soft, but uh, in its effect very hard. Um, it is Pyongyang, which is a uh, two million uh, inhabitant city, and um, the city, towns, villages are uh, are very important for the for the problem of singularity or universality, which uh, makes uh, the problem of human being. Uh, in a, in a way, uh, uh, seenable. So now a few uh, thoughts uh, about urbanism. The question of what makes the urban so attractive can only be described via all the possible phenomena, for instance, shopping opportunities, culture, cultural offerings, cinema, opera, sport events, etc. These are, however, only individual random examples. Even if all of these example, examples could be told together, this would still not offer an explanation of what the basis for the particular attra attractiveness of a city is for so many people. It must be linked to the particular urban situation in which the individual, the city dweller, can be linked to the general thus to the city, to the urban. Initially, the individual is, as a mere member of the urban form, an inhabitant of a city, part of the general, of the respective urbanity. The, city, the citizen who lives in Berlin so not only as, only a per, is not only a person, but also a Berliner. No matter what type of character an individual Berlin person has as a Berliner, he will be assigned a Berlin typical generality, such as witty, cheeky, cheeky, charm, something like that. I don't know what it is in London, so I cannot tell you. Maybe he has something with the weather. An aspect of the quality of this generality is easily accounted for, his, for historically. In the, citizen, in, the, in the citizenry of ancient Rome, if people gained human rights at all, in today's sense of the word, it was only as a member of the Populus Romanus, thus as a citizen of Rome. Otherwise, they were a slave, exile, etc., and enjoyed either no or very limited leg legal rights of the community. Here the problematic area of inclusion and exclusion areas arise with which con contemporary architectural soci sociologically describes the problematic areas of our cities, like we saw in Detroit and in Padua with that walls. Another of the many possible examples of the subordinary ordination of individuality and overriding generality is the membership of a religious society, a little bit we saw it in Pyongyang, in which the individual only becomes assimilated into a society through a baptism or initiation ritual and only in the context of corresponding spiritual salvations. The relationship between an individual person and a generic setting, here the urban setting, functions via the economy of aspiration, or put another way, via functionalization of emotions as the expression of aspiration under particular interests. Because these interests come together so densely in urban settings, these urban settings are definition, uh, definitions as definitions are 
comparatively uh, espe especially charged and in the respect are particularly attractive in terms for desire for, on the one hand, security, but also conflict. The individual always experience themselves in conflict with their environment. And that they connect the specific as experienced in the environment with the individual conceptual orientation we talked about. You can also say worldview, super ego, ideologic things. The specific, the experienced, thus for instance a building, arises according to, uh, to epistemology only through an individual act of judgment, thus of the connecting of that which is recognized in the perception and the sense giving arrangements in the judgment gained from conceptual orientation. In the dense urban setting, these very different individual systems as well as group systems collide and can lead in the best case scenario to the productive examination of individually conserved words, as well as in terms of possible actions. This account for the attractiveness of the urban, firstly the merging of the individual into the general and secondly the potential opening up of spaces of possibility in conflict with the conceived words. What happens in towns like Berlin is maybe different to that what is in London, but we have uh, another uh, field on, on research at, at the moment in Berlin, so-called townhouses, and we want to show you now what that <laughs> means. <coughs> So we are talking r about an area which is quite centrally located, close to the Außen Ministerium, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Maybe it's 500 meters to the to the castle we will reconstruct. It's quite huge blocks. This is like the normal uh, prefabricated housing type in former East Germany. But that's a size of buildings in that area. And we have a new ordering of desire, which is much more relating back to the 19th or even the 18th century. And what we're talking about now, or what's the third case study, is in the middle. You can see that it's quite smaller units. And it's not even quite smaller. It's Units like six meter fifty wide, six fifty. So the whole ground was divided up in new uh, crowns, like twenty five meters deep to six meter fifty wide, and they were sold. They were all sold. So uh, how we call it, uh, Erbbaurecht? How we have it here in leasehold? Leasehold, not at all. It's all sold and was sold to a neue Stadtbürger, how the former uh, senator called them. Like it's not correctly translated by new inhabitants, it's, it's like citizens. it's new citizens that should come to Berlin because Berlin was, is still a quite pure city. So they wanted to have people coming in that would normally live in villas outside Berlin. So is it looking like? Though it's like all single family houses. Maybe they rent out little space, but normally not. Maybe for two or three uh, au pair girls. Maybe they have a little practice in, but it's single family housing. As it's only six meter fifty wide. 
So the normal Berlin block out of the 19th century would come with like 15 meters, 20 meters, so it's clear you have a courtyard, you have rent space and different uses. And then the entrances are looking like this. So it's just like four of them. So all photos are from last Sunday. <coughs> and it looks, it was astonishing that they all have black cars. It's quite a homogeneous group of people living there. It's not longer, it's not even a middle class. And everybody got his own architect, as you can see. But the effect cannot be described, let's say, by the appearing, like the, like the pure appearing of the, of the different architectures. There's no difference whether it's white or dark in terms of social effects. And this model, which is called townhouse, is really the only functioning current architectural production in Berlin for housing. It's the only new housing is based on townhouses models, which always produce this very homogeneous neighborhood. Now we come to a deeper uh, look in what happens in receiving architecture. To my mind, and it has to do with singularity and universality, which I spoke about uh, when uh, when we talked about urbanism and Pyongyang. To my mind, by being born, we all live in a genius, muse, spiritual situation. By being born, we are separated from our mother, from the nature and the universality. From the genius, we singular, singularize, individualize, with advancing years of our life. Our problem is, how can man as an individual relate to the general in such a way that once he has been enveloped with it, he is still able to survive. Perception and recognition, so theory, in opposite to practice, always results from the intention of self actualization. In perception, one already becomes conscious of the perceived other, for example, architecture, as one such thing that relates to the satisfaction of the perceived subject in a particular way. The exterior world is shaped through perception, recognition, is However, not simulatively that of the necessity of the subject in the sense of self-actualization of the already satisf satisfying exterior world. It is possibly indirectly satisfying or to be disregarded. Either way, it must be changed in the second step we are in action than to practice. That is what we mean with theory and practice falling in one. So there's at first the perception and the second maybe the action, but it has uh, <coughs> closed together, it's only the two, the two hands of, this, of the same thing. Now something funny will happen. I will design something. For to, for to explain how uh, this connection between the object and... I think it's loud enough, or... No? 
Man muss sich das so vorstellen, ich mache mal hier das, was wir sozusagen das I nennen, einfach weil es immer schief ist. Englisch, so, Englisch sorry. <lacht> I, I draw what we call the Z, because it's always not uh, correct uh, ornament, it's uh, what we call sheep. And this uh, wants to show everything with which exists, which is possible to exist. So that's the whole world. And so you can understand directly that everything which is inside this whole world is uh, connected by being in this world and has influence on each other. For example, a human being, which is maybe this. And for example, an arch architecture, which is this. So this is the object and this is the subject. Um, what makes it complicated is that, that, not only that these are those both are not the only things which exist. They exist in other groups of things and beings. So maybe this is a field. <coughs> also in this field, with other fields, with other uh, objects, in this field, and this is connected with this, and this with them, and so on. And maybe here is something which is connected <coughs> with this, and there are overlappings. So this and this thing are together with maybe this, and so on. But what happens now? Um, if this, for example, here are eyes, yes? If you open your eyes and want to see the object, so you have the you are perceiving, you have the perception of this object, and this goes in and here back and forward. But that's not all. Um, At first I have to, yes, maybe I make it step by step. So, because then I have the, con the, the, the perfect English expression. The emergence of sensation, this is what happens by opening the eye. No? The second step is experience of spatial and temporal sensation. So this is in space and in, in <coughs> time. That must be something which comes from the subject. The third step is categorical interpretation of terms as uh, causality, substancy, and those things. So it is a completely interpretation of that what happens, because you know this little game, this comes on the, on the, in the eye, this is here, and this is here, and it's top down, and, but that's only the physical things that are not so interesting. And um, the, the, the meanings as causality also are overlaid over the thing, so you have a completely human view on this, a fly, which is maybe here, would have another perception of, <coughs> of this object. But if you, if you look at this thing you know, more exactly, we can describe it in different language games. For example, we took one by Sigmund Freud because he lived a long time in London, and so you understand the terms he used. He says, uh, he makes something like this. This is called the Ich, the Ego, and here we have the Super Ego, and here we have something like an it, an, an is. Um, so the, the ego has to make a connection between the desire, the, the life which comes from a biological sphere. Uh, it's not so important now to explain exactly, but this is something where you have no real, not really an influence on it. But it is always there, and that's 
makes it you alive, that you want to eat it, that, that you want to have uh, sex, that you want to over uh, live the, the time. And here in this super ego, everything which you, which your cultural, map, the cultural memory uh, uh, includes what you get from your parents, from the cultural influence around you. From, hmm? from the school. From, mm -hmm. from school, yes. So with all this, it goes to, so if we have it like here, like this, and we say, not to explain this in a different way, we say it's a, it's a Vorstellungsorientierung, the conceptual orientation, which makes the sense in the view on the, on the object. Haben was vergessen? No. You can, you can also talk, I don't know how you, if, if someone has uh, read uh, Bourdieu, dear Bourdieu, because he, his expression for that uh, conceptual orientation or superego is uh, habitus, which means all the influence which are coming from such a field and makes that this field has a special world view in opposite to maybe this field here. And this is important because what uh, what uh, Bourdieu is describing as these fields is uh, called uh, functional system uh, in, in the term by Niklas Luhmann and he is very, very much harder than Bourdieu. In, in Bourdieu's opinion these systems are a little bit open, they have possibilities to play with each other and uh, for Niklas Luhmann they are really closed and uh, self-organized. They reproduce themselves in a hard way so that you have no chance to, to get a new, uh, a new uh, uh, habitus or a new worldview. But that are only, only types of looking on the situation. To explain what uh, happened next. The, the feeling of desire Aversion arises through the comparison in the content of perception recognition with the content of conceptual orientation. The experiencing of these feelings is evoked through the capacity of aspiration. Sorry, it's in Germany, Begehrungsvermögen. Uh, maybe the expression don't really uh, is. Uh, possible to, trans to translate. So we have, um, we have only the perception and the recognition. But then um, this feeling of uh, desire or aversion in uh, connection to the self-actualization uh, uh, makes what how you, how, what sense this object has for you. Um, so you have a, um, the perception goes over that, which maybe is, if you want to maybe uh, spaceable, the perception goes through the eye, over the super ego, over the S, together back to the eye, and say to the perception, which is maybe here, only for to show in the model, it's good or it's not so good, I have to handle, or uh, uh, it's uh, it's okay the situation, and that's uh, that's the thing what the architects have to have to know if they want to order relationships between people. They have to organize this object in a way, like in the townhouses or in the Padua wall or in the, that very difficult uh, way in uh, in Pyong Pyongyang that you come in contact in that way in which you want it with that conceptual orientation. So if you make everything that the flower and these two flowers in uh, Pyongyang are positively uh, connected with the presidents 
you can uh, yes you can uh, make a lot of buildings all with these flowers and over the conceptual orientation which you have influenced shown in earlier time of the of the people they will have good feelings with all of this and want to maybe uh, are in a good connection with that force of political inter interest. Mm. On the other way, um, in, in, in North Af Africa, you, you see what can happen if this grows together. I was wondering if this might be a good moment to open up the discussion, because after all, we said it would be a public seminar. And have so far, we have two people speaking. So I think we, we would like to in involve others in the discussion. Because Maybe they come closer. If they dare. <laughs> <laughs> because the studies that you presented are not that easily accessible. They are slightly difficult. So I think there, there might be a sort of desire to discuss. I already have the first hands coming, coming up here. Um, so what I Oh, I don't like microphone. It me nauseous. Um, as some sort of beginning, that's horrible. Beginning, do I have to use this? Um, yeah, so if you imagine it's some sort of Lacanian big other and some sort of beginning psychoanalytic terms. But what I think is important is that what essentially is being described in the two or three or four circles is some sort of rhizome type knowledge in that inherent in it is some sort of sporadity in that equally you can negotiate the environment on very quickly different levels and different planes. Sort of a schizophrenic analysis is the, the very obvious delusion type idea of things. But what I'm trying to say is that everything is organised on that immediate psychology, but that psychology in its, in its imparting and from leaving here to here is approximated is in distances in that you can only see as far as whatever's in front of you and you can only, you only know as much as you do know. But because everything's oriented by approximations, what you can relate to in talking about uh, Adorno's principle of the negative dialectic in uh, the step back must be planned, you can talk about Mao thinking about uh, revolutions are always having to occur every 15 to 20 years. Or you can talk about Lenin's analogy about the runner who, before he wins the 100 meter race, has to step back onto his vault and launch forward. And I think what needs to, we need to adjust is that it's this idea of approximation that makes a lot of sense in this architecture because you, we talk about proximity as in the space because we talk about Berliners and we talk about Londoners. You know, I'm a Londoner, but I'm a South Londoner, and I'm very different to a North Londoner, and I'm very different to a West Londoner. I couldn't possibly have ever grown up in the West London, you see? There's different, and if we can come to some sort of vault mechanism in which you describe an Adorno, it's basically just Adorno's negative dialectic affects all decisions. And perhaps even going back to Foucault before he finished his biopolitics, you know, because if every action's politicized, perhaps maybe that's what's gonna mock. Maybe we've forgotten that a lot of our gestures, you know. And you know, you did the the flowers in. Uh, it's the same, you know. A morning in London is full of this siren, this green siren that goes around London, and she barks at you and she asks you to buy coffee. And the whole store is full, you know. London is full of coffee. You know, it's a coffee centre. It's the very morning, and they shop very early on like other stores. And it's it's just the same trend, you know. But it's very distance, as in, I can only talk about that because this is what I know, I'm here far too often, far too much. So I'm just saying, I'm just suggesting, perhaps another way of looking at it is approximating distances. That's a lot, because you said a lot, and I wanted to say a lot. 